Well, thank you, um, Holly and Wendy members both for having me here tonight. It's really a pleasure to be here. So I'm Angela Lopez. Um, I'm a leadership coach for heart-centered women leaders who are awakening to or curious about conscious leadership. And a fun fact about me is that I am a mountain biker who appreciates gear and clothing that basically just disappear uh, because it fits and functions really well. And my favorite pair of mountain biking shorts are not only as light as a feather, but they're covered with peacock feathers. So just a fun fact. Uh, land acknowledgement. I reside and work on land that occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Cayuse, Umatia, Walla Walla, Atfal, pardon me for saying these wrong, Atfali, Atfatali, and Kalapuya. And offering this land acknowledgement, I am affirming Indigenous sovereignty, history, and experiences. Okay, so y'all are here to hear about this topic that sounds incredibly depressing. And I'm going to start by sharing a story of a time when I found myself in this place with you. When I was eight years old, I had my life all figured out. After months and months of deep and thoughtful contemplation, I'd finally figured out the Holy Grail, what I wanted to be when I grew up. So I marched myself into the house, planted my foot, triumphantly down on the ground and staked my claim to my future and to my parents. I want to be a marine biologist. I mean, for me, as a kid, who basically the world stopped for when Jacques Cousteau was on TV, it was kind of obvious, right? My parents, though, were far less enthusiastic than me. They were like, well, we live in Montana. So that's going to be kind of hard for you. So then I came up with a new plan. Okay, I'll be an astronaut. And my parents said, well, that's not practical. Because we live in Montana, and astronauts are white males, and you're neither of those things. And this was in the 1980s. So we actually hadn't had our first woman astronaut, Sally Ride. But my parents trying to be helpful, said, well, you like science. Maybe you could teach it instead of doing it in space or under the water. Sounded reasonable. So I went, eh, okay. And then I became a science teacher. And I was excited about it. I mean, I loved lab day. I loved helping kids be like real scientists. They'd hook up their probes and collect data in real time. They'd figure out what it meant and they'd figure out why it mattered. I helped kids do service learning projects where they surveyed debris on beaches and then studied how it affected the local whale population. I got to see kids in my classroom who walked in through the door saying, ah, oh, I hate science class, transform into kids who went back home to their parents at the end of the year and told them what kind of scientists they were gonna be. So I felt really accomplished. I'd done the thing that I was supposed to do and it was creating an impact. And even though that was happening, it was creating all this amazing impact. I dreaded it. Sunday nights, well, they were like torture. And at the end of every day, my bucket was just empty, like the bottom had been cut out. I was dangerously close to getting bitter. I was depleted, exhausted, reluctant, procrastinating, and complacent. There was absolutely no zest in my work. It was flat, bland, and yucky to me. And I started to realize, oh, shit, this isn't what I want. Ever since that conversation in the early 80s, where my parents gently redirected me from marine biology to being a science teacher, I'd been pursuing this goal. I was stuck in the, you have to. And I just got so busy in the doing of it 
in the earning of credentials, in the daily grind of teaching, that my drive just took over. And I never even stopped to look at whether I liked where I was driving to. I couldn't believe it. I had done everything right. I had followed the rules. I did the thing that made my dad happy. So why the heck didn't it work for me? When I looked back, I realized that I was living my dad's dream more than mine. Because when I was a really, really little kid, my dad was super passionate about education and making sure that everybody had access to it. I used to go with him to talk with migrant families, and his job was to make sure that kids were enrolled in school. And even though that was part of his job, he probably would have done it for free. Now, later on, he went on to work in schools. He was a counselor, and then he became a principal and administrator. So he could not have been more pleased, his word, and proud of me being a teacher. I just remember the love on his face when he would say to me, Ange, you're the only one of the four girls who went into education, and you're one of the really good teachers. And even though I didn't like it, Stan just seemed so reasonable because I'd already spent so many years building credentials, experience, and expertise. So I stayed for 16 years. But I secretly kind of hated it. And I got further and further away from that passionate little girl who was so excited about marine biology by never actually having seen the ocean other than on TV. And I'm not alone, right? You all are here at a talk. Oh, you're here at a suck. Now what? For a reason. We've all been in that position where we climb the mountain with the best of intentions and then find ourselves at the top with a mediocre view and cliff bars just strewn all around from the other hikers. And the mountain climb that we thought would set us up for success in life just doesn't feel worth it at all. So what went wrong? There was enough of what we wanted to get us to this point. In some cases, money, prestige, societal narratives, for me, family expectations, that old story of who you hold yourself to be. Maybe it was belonging to some club or not belonging to another club. There's also the sunk cost fallacy. For me, well, I already did six years of education school, lots of licenses and exams. Truly, we never even asked ourselves what we wanted in the first place. Or maybe we thought something better or different was impossible. Maybe we couldn't find a way to do it. Or we never even stopped to consider that there could be another way. And without realizing it, all of us, just like me, divorce ourselves from who we truly are and who we want to be. So we were coming at our lives from the outside in. We were letting other people define what we were doing, what we wanted, what we said yes to, and we surrendered our no's. And this resulted in us being away from the person that our soul came to be. And that's the problem. So we need to turn inwards and learn to love ourselves again so that we can generate our next mountain from the inside out. And to build a life from the inside out, we need to focus on two things. 
resonance and fulfillment. And these things are what's really going to help you sleep at night. No more, I have to keep going. And no more overwhelm. Finding yourself in that place of, God, I just can't do this anymore. So let's start by talking about resonance. Think about how it felt when you climbed that mountain that you secretly didn't want. It was terrible, right? You were out of sync. It was noisy. There were bad vibrations. This is a state of dissonance where nothing quite lines up the way that it should. Then there's resonance. And that's what you were looking for at the top of that mountain. Resonance is when everything is aligned, harmonious, and starting to feel right. In resonance, there's flow and connection, authenticity, and a sense of ease. Your day is filled not with things that you have to do, but things you're enjoying. And you just feel lit up. It's a feeling of leadership. If our actions are lining up with our true desires and our values. And we can start leading ourselves from this space. And this is a picture of what resonance feels like for me. This is a picture of me and my sisters getting ready to spend the day in nature. Getting up early in the morning and doing Literally whatever we felt like. Wherever nature pulled us, we went. It was about doing what resonated in the moment for us. On this day, we were just having a great day. I was with my three best friends. We had nothing to do. Just all this freedom. And we got to immerse ourselves in the animals and the beauty. So this photo is a great representation of resonance. When I look at the photo, I can feel it in my body, the love, the freedom, the excitement. It was so good and so easy in those days and those moments. And that's what resonance is. So I've got three questions for you, and I would love for you to answer in the chat. When in your life have you felt resonance? the way I felt it on the ranch or in that picture with my sisters. Getting teaching coaching at the ocean with my kids. Good. Thank you, Andrea. Making the people I love laugh. I love that. Okay. Amanda says when she's helping coach our mentee, I'm coaching our mentee. Great. Nice. When I'm co-playing, I'm kind of like, it's nice. Coaching's nice. Winning in sports, Dana says. Got the competitive edge coming in. Great. Thank you all. I appreciate your participation. Well, another thing in the chat, if you would, please. What do you notice right now in your body as you think about these things that help you feel resonance? Trust, lightness. Nice. Body feels free and flowing. Excellent, Sandra. Thank you. Tingling and a sense of warmth. And the warmth. Nice, Amanda. Hopeful, to be honest, sense. It makes me feel energized and happy just to think about it. Yeah. Great. Thank you all. I appreciate you sharing. Again, on a scale of 1 to 10 and no 7s, how resonant is your overall experience these days? Jill, minus a 3. Okay. Yeah. Brenda says a 10. Thank you for your honesty. Appreciate that. Jillian says a 3. So if your reading is below a six, then you know you've got some work to do to move into a place of greater resonance. And if you're at an eight or above, that is wonderful and inspiring because it's rare and precious. Please keep doing exactly what you're doing. And now let's talk about fulfillment. Part of the challenge is that we've been focusing on this mountain or the achievement that the mountain represents. 
But achievement isn't what makes us feel fulfilled. There's this great quote from Doris Bauman and Will Baldrich, a psychologist at the University of Zurich in Switzerland, who do research on fulfillment. And they say, it's not achievement per se, but that which feels worthy and remains that way later in life that fulfills a human. So what they mean by worthy is pursuing projects that personally matter and are meaningful to you. Making a positive difference, leaving something of value. And you want these things to be important to you later in life, not just this week, but something that makes a lasting difference. So if you would share in the chat, when in your life have you felt fulfilled? And if you can't think of a time that you yourself have felt fulfilled, maybe you've been around someone who has. There might be a mentor or a role model. And when you think of them, you probably think of them because they represent something, like a way of being that you aspire to. Think about what it's like to be around them. And if you could share in the chat, either one in your life you felt fulfilled, maybe a person and a way of being that you aspire to that reflects fulfillment for you. Nice. Brenda says that when she sees clients do much better presentations than they did the first time she saw them. See that you've made a difference helping someone. Nice. Solving problems and helping people. When I want a hackathon. Okay. Accomplishing a goal. Nice. Yeah. Thank you all. I appreciate that. Um, Holly says, I think I only catch it in moments, but it doesn't sustain. Okay. Anytime she gets an email from a client telling her about their latest salary bump or promotion or when. So in the chat or just for yourself, think about what work is worthy of your time, attention, and gifts. Think about it through that lens of fulfillment. And if anything is coming up for you, and you're willing to share it in the chat. Thank you for that. Yeah, Judy, I see when your work helps others change their lives. Definitely. Oh, nice, Jill. Your current work is very, very worthy. Changing the world for the better. Don't understand why I'm so drained from it. Mm. Thank you for your honesty. I appreciate that. And your vulnerability for sharing it. And Jill, we'll share some things that may help here in just a few moments. So one more question for now in the chat. And on a scale of one to 10, again, no sevens, how fulfilled are you these days overall? And again, if your rating is below a six, then you know you've got some work to do to move into a place of more fulfillment. If you're at an eight or above, truly, I'm so happy for you because this is inspiring. It's rare, precious. And it's really important that you keep doing what you're doing because you're giving permission to everyone who's below a six to do what they need to do and to follow in your footsteps. So we're working towards a new inside out vision of your life that's built on the concept of resonance and fulfillment. And this is pretty pie in the sky and theoretical nonsense. And remember, I'm a science teacher, so I want the instructions for how to do the lab to be crystal clear. So how do you actually do? Let's we'll start with looking at how we got here in a little more detail. Look at me here. And remember, you're coming from this place of, oh, shit, this isn't what I want. Because it wasn't what we wanted. But there was enough of what we wanted in there to get us to this point. So let's pay attention to that. Now, we all know about the carrot and the carrot in the cart. So what part of the carrot did you want? Or go one layer deeper 
and consider what did it represent or offer for you? See if you can figure out what that mountain really meant for your life. Was it approval? Was it easy or something that you knew you could achieve without extending yourself? Is it safety? Some of you might have an instantaneous answer to that question, just like I had when I was eight years old about being a marine biologist. And some of you might not have a clear answer yet. What do you want now? And what do you know about what you want? Don't have an answer? Or maybe you're still in the, oh, shit, phase. It's okay if you only have part of the answer. You can work with what you do know. Whatever your usual way of operating is, in other words, the way you got here, do the exact opposite. So if you are a go, 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 Give yourself grace to just find the answer or truth and counter that energy to go, go, go and get, get, get. Give yourself pause, faith. And if you're always listening to everyone else's advice, don't you dare. Because your internal will gets to be engaged here. Now, it might come out of the gate screaming with ideas for you, or it might be very quiet. And it might take some cultivation because after a lifetime of your usual way of doing things, it might not switch in 20 minutes. So we've been talking about uncovering what led us to the place that we don't want to be and then figuring out what we actually want instead. So the next step is to figure out how to get where we actually want to go. So how do you get there? And the first thing is take baby steps because we often feel really overwhelmed by too many possibilities if we don't have a clear path or an approach. And you can also take the leap of faith and just know that the step will be provided for you. I think it's Kurt Vonnegut who said, we have to continually be jumping off cliffs and developing our wings on the way down. No idea how to do that? Well, the good news is I've got four ways for you to learn how to trust yourself and take the leap into resonant fulfillment. Let's talk about each of these. The first thing you can do is become friends with your heart again and allow it to weigh in on your decisions. Can you tune into your heart? Or is there a blank void of nothingness where your heart should be. Here are some exercises to help you connect to your heart if you're not someone who can tune in automatically. I want you to try this and type what's coming up for you in the chat. Think about the thing you want, the self-defined mountain that you want to climb. Now, some of you might not have that yet. So if not, just think about the mountain you already climbed, the one that you didn't like in the end. As you think about it, notice where the energy is in your body. What does it feel like? Is there a sense of movement or motion? Is it just a sensation? Thank you, Brenda. It's tingling in my chest, she says. It may be a feeling. It could also be a taste. 
when people actually hear songs start playing. It could be a scent or a smell memory. Or if it's that mountain that you already climbed, it might show up like a spiky ball. Just noticing it as a start. And as you tune into that thing that you sense, should have focused on it more tonight. Or you can also try a couple of other things. And Amanda, I see it feels like it's in your head. And when I think about where I want to go, the sensation is in my chest. You know, great noticing. You can talk to yourself out loud. So I notice, oh, when I'm anxious, there's a feeling of heat and it's right here. Right here where my ribs come together. You can also journal about it. If you're someone that journals, just be open to it. Because whatever it is that it takes for you to take this invitation and explore it further will help you get reconnected with your heart. So let's turn our attention now to our second method. Exploring your relationship with uncertainty. Your ability to withstand and be with uncertainty is proportional to the amount of permission you can give yourself to climb the mountains that are right for you versus the mountains that are right for someone else or are the correct mountains that everyone else has done. Because the mountains that everyone else does or the ones that other people are co-signing have way less uncertainty because they're the path traveled by many. But when you define your own mountain, there might not be that pre-worn path that tells you with certainty that it will all work out. It's like the caterpillar inside the chrysalis, right? That icky, gooey mess that is the transformation to the butterfly is necessary. So if you want to be able to climb the mountains that you define, you need to be able to be with uncertainty. How is your current relationship to uncertainty hurting you? How is it helping you? Feel free to share a little bit about that in the chat. Question for you to consider as well is how willing are you to accept, live with, be with, withstand more uncertainty? And I see some comments in the chat. She said that uncertainty makes her feel very anxious. Uh, says a complicated relationship. Sometimes it helps, other times it hurts. And Jillian says, it's pushing me to do something about the uncertainty and lack of fulfillment. That's also stressful. Yeah. And Amanda says, it, it's hurting me by making me question if I'll be successful. It's helping me by getting me to think about ways to de-risk my plan. Nice. And then Brenda, I'm much more comfortable with uncertainty since I started my business at 61. Good for you than I ever was as a lawyer. I need to accept uncertainty or I'd have given up on my business. We've all been through a lot of uncertainty lately. What is your relationship with the divine or the state of your spiritual well-being? I invite you to consider exploring it further because we are not meant to live life alone spiritually. So I invite you to ask yourself and really be open to the answers to, is there a divine? Can you rely on it in times of uncertainty? And are you okay with your current set of belief? Now let's talk about considering yourself as a whole. It fundamentally weakens us as beings when we consider ourselves as broken, compartmentalized, splintered, 
or anything other than whole. Because we are undercutting ourselves and our ability to shine our light in the world. It's part of why we find ourselves on the wrong mountain. We've given our power away and we start valuing what others say about what mountain is right for us instead of choosing our own mountain. What stories do you tell yourself about how you're broken? How might you know? One suggestion is starting tonight by looking at the high and low points on your life's journey and seeing if you can uncover some of the stories. If you held yourself as complete and whole as you are now, what mountain would you climb? If you're starting to get a sense from this, stay with that thought. And if you're not sure, this question home with you tonight too. The next step is to allow yourself to be worthy. See, sometimes we're held back from the peaks that we love because we don't think we deserve them. We don't think we have the skills or temerity to climb them. We don't believe it's possible or possible for someone like us. And whatever we believe about our worthiness, we assume we're right about it. So we are. Because we create a world that lines up with our beliefs. What would it be like if you saw yourself as completely worthy. Sir in the chat. Jillian says, I'd be so content. Yeah. And it says, I would be unstoppable. Right. Yeah. Holly says, I'd do better when the world doesn't come through the way I want. Hmm. Judy, I'd go after everything instead of second guessing. Thanks. Sandra says, I see, see myself walking down the path and pushing away everything that is an obstacle. So what would you do that you're not doing now if you saw yourself as completely worthy? And thank you for those of you that have already put your answers in the chat. We started figuring out what we actually wanted and how to get there. And these four things, becoming friends with your heart again, exploring your relationship with uncertainty, considering yourself whole, and allowing yourself to be worthy just as you are, will help you reconnect your GPS if you're someone who has run your life from the outside in instead of the inside out. And then once you've got a lead on what mountain you want to climb, there's only one thing to do. Get started on it. What are some baby steps that you are willing to take now? And know that these will be specific to you because you are redefining your life. So pick one, just one baby step that you're willing and able to take now. And tell us what that is in the chat. Holly, more, mem fem mem more feminist nerd time for her. Actually scheduled into her calendar <laughs> and listen to different differently in her coaching sessions. Thank you, Holly. Dana, moving back to Southern California for your mental health. Good for you. So a four month nap, that's right. Moving a slow life for a while, refinding who you are when you're not working. Good for you. Amanda, registering a business name. Good for you. Holly, finding books on grief. Good. Great. 
They're all great baby steps. And once you've taken these little baby steps, keep taking them. The most important part here is to keep moving rather than collapsing or going into superhero mode. Keep moving. And a couple of things. Other people will not get this. And it doesn't matter. My dad didn't get it. He wanted me to keep teaching. It doesn't matter because your amazing life is on the other side of this. So we've spent a lot of time talking about climbing up the wrong mountain. And we've given you an outline here of how to make it so you never end up on the wrong mountain again. Up until now, you've been living a life that was defined externally, climbing mountains other people found exciting, that society said were strategically smart, pursuing the goals that everyone other than you had. And it's been awful. The climb is awful because throughout the struggle, there's never really a yummy enough carrot at the top to propel you up. And then even worse, when you get to the top, you're disappointed. My dad was so proud of me and I just wanted to stop teaching because it wasn't even what I wanted. And I don't want that for you. You deserve more. It's not only that you deserve more, it's that you're worthy. All of you in this room are worthy of a resonant, fulfilling life, career, relationships, everything. I want all of you to have a career where you don't have the Sunday scaries dread. I want you to get to the top of a mountain you want and stop having to attend treatment for TMJ because you're stress grinding your teeth at night. I want your holy shit moments to be, holy shit, I can't believe I get to do this today and somebody's going to pay me for it. Not holy shit, why am I up at the top of this mountain with these vapid influencers taking selfies? Am I one of them now? I want you to have a huge grin on your face, sitting next to your best friend, feeling so resonant that you remember it years and years later, and then build a whole talk around how to get that feeling again. I want you to have resonance and fulfillment. And I want you to be the one who chooses it from the inside out. Today, I've given you a bunch of tools to do that. And the fun thing is, as much as you can use all these tools and techniques as a way in, y'all are Dorothy with the red slippers. You've had it in you all along. You don't need this damn slide. You know how to do this. Because all of it, the mountain climbing, the holy shit moments, the resonance, it's all about you understanding yourself more thoroughly and expressing that so you know what to do. This is actually a journey of consciousness, getting in tune with who you are and your true purpose. And actually, the universe is the true purpose for you. I trust you. You can be friends with your heart again. You can be with uncertainty. You are whole. And you are worthy. Now, go find your mountain. And please stay in touch. I'd love to help you if you're feeling stuck, if you want to guide, or partner to help you along the way.